Okay, so this is a video that's been a long time in the making. I've wanted to do my anti-RGB setup for a really long time, but there were always these issues that kept popping up. Like I couldn't cool certain components properly in this case, and there were peripherals that just, I couldn't get them to match my design aesthetic that I was going for, so I just waited. I waited until everything lined up nicely before I made this video, and that's where we are today because stuff has lined up nicely. Let's start off with the case. This is a case that I've showcased several times on my channel. This is the Ghost S1 from a company called Lowkey. It is, in my opinion, the best looking small form factor case right now. It's eight and a half liters, so it's very small, has room for a full size GPU, and it's very easy to work in for a case that is of this size. There's a new Cooler Master case that I thought was quite interesting, the NR200, I believe. It has a very similar design aesthetic, but it turns out that is a much larger case. That thing's 18 liters versus eight. This is like half the size. So yeah, I wanted to keep it small. Now building in this case has never been difficult in terms of fit, but it's always been difficult to cool well. Now last year I was running the Intel 9900K, an eight core CPU, but I wanted to get this thing even more juiced up. I tried to run the AMD 3950X, way too hot. Couldn't cool this thing on air, at least not without like the extra top hats and stuff. I just wanted to keep it small like this. I also tried the 3900X, still too hot. I ended up settling on the Intel 10900K. Now that's a CPU that's still really hot. It's 10 cores and I had to lock the CPU boost to 4.8 gigahertz. I don't let it go past that. It runs hot, it's still like 87, 88 degrees, but it doesn't break 90 and it doesn't ever throttle. And that's really the only goal I had with this system. I don't think I can push this case running on air without the extra top hats and stuff. I don't think I can push it harder than this. This is the most powerful system that I can personally build in this case. I actually had to use an angle grinder on the motherboard heatsink to be able to fit the CPU cooler this time. It was tight. So we have 32 gigs of RAM and it's all sitting on a Gigabyte Z490i motherboard with all the RGB lights turned off. The GPU is the RTX 2080 Ti. This is on its last legs in terms of like being the king of GPUs. This is two years old at this point, but I also had to do some mods on this thing. So the GeForce RTX font at the top turns green and it's really bright. So I popped off the front plate on the cooler to access the RGB lighting and there was no way to easily disconnect it or so I thought, so I cut it. And then when I tried to actually remove the cable, I pulled that connector right off that PCB. It ended up working perfectly though. There's just no way for me to easily reconnect the GeForce RTX logo back to the lighting system, but I'm good with that. Now the performance on this machine is excellent. It's a 10 core CPU, RTX 2080 Ti. I mean, what do you expect, right? It's gonna push out some excellent numbers and the thermals are acceptable to me for the size of this system. Now this setup uses one display panel and it's a really nice one. So my old setup videos, I've always had this 38 inch widescreen from LG. It's a 38 UC99, I've used it for three, maybe four years. Fantastic screen, but it was starting to show its age. They finally have a new one that fits my needs perfectly. So this is, again, 38 inches widescreen, but better color accuracy and 144 hertz with one millisecond response time. It's super fast. It's the perfect screen to me. It's G-Sync compatible if that's your jam. It is so nice. This is really the screen that I've always wanted over these years. Like it's this, it's a screen that's good for gaming, and for doing work, right? It's everything in one panel. It's bright, it's color accurate. It is so good, I love it. I think I'm gonna replace all of the displays that I have in the studio with more of those 38 inch screens. They're so good. I highly recommend this display. And they also have good speakers. If you notice in my setup, I don't have external speakers. Now this is something that is just my personal taste. I don't need external speakers. As long as the ones that are built into the display sound good. And these ones are nice and it keeps the whole desk clean. Now, if I'm ever playing games, I don't rely on externals. I use these ones. This is the new Surface Headphone 2 from Microsoft. We've done like a mini review on them. Because of Bluetooth 5 and just, I guess, new hardware from Microsoft, there's no noticeable latency. I can comfortably play competitive shooters with the Surface Headphones 2. So let's talk about the mouse and keyboard next. I feel like this is the last part of the, of the setup. Okay, this is a mouse most people have not heard of. This is something that has a bit of a backstory to it. I was sent a kind of engineering sample or prototype of this mouse sometime like January or February of this year. And when they sent it to me, they were very hopeful. They wanted me to do a video on it and I didn't like it. At the time I was like, the idea is cool, but there's issues with it. Like there's some build quality issues I didn't love and like the wiring wasn't ideal. 
I just told them I'm not going to make a video on it. Then I ended up buying the retail unit. Like I think the retail ones came out sometime in the spring and they fixed a lot of the stuff that I talked about. And I just, I feel bad that I shut them down earlier. So this is actually the mouse that I've been using for the past few months. And you guys have seen them in videos and people have asked, what is that mouse? I've never done a video on it or anything, but this is the Ponage Ultra Custom. It's the world's lightest wireless mouse if you're into counting grams, but it's a really good mouse. Now I wouldn't put it in the same category of performance as like a G Pro Wireless or like the Viper Ultimate from Razer. Those I would consider to be better mice, but this has two advantages. Number one, it's cheaper, it's a hundred bucks. Two, it uses USB-C charging. This is a feature that I do not understand why so many companies refuse to put onto their gaming mice still. Like there's $200 gaming mice out there that are brand new that still use micro USB for whatever reason. This uses USB-C and in an era where like all of my devices are USB-C, it's nice to be able to just connect it up to juice it up. So 40 hours of battery life, it's a really good mouse. Personally, I actually can't tell the difference between the sensor between this and let's say the G Pro Wireless, but I would say that if you're super competitive like MLG Pro, you might notice a difference, but I think most people will really like the performance on this mouse. And you can also remove the back plate. Like if you don't like the smooth finish, you can pop it off and throw on a honeycomb material for a decreased weight, but yeah, solid mouse. Now, uh, there is, I'd say one main disadvantage to this, their software sucks. It's super ugly and it's not particularly intuitive, but because you just have to install it once, set it up to the way that you want it, and then it'll work, you just remove that software when you're done. And I just turn off all my RGBs because that's how the anti-RGB setup is. Now the mouse pad, okay, we gotta talk about this mouse pad. So this is made by Razer and it comes from their new work from home lineup. It's called the Razer Pro Slide, no glide, and it's a really simple mouse pad. It's 10 bucks, but you know how rare it is or how hard it is to find a gray or white mouse pad that doesn't look stupid? These guys did it, and it's got this nice gray material on the bottom, the rubber, with a nice hexagon pattern if you're into hexagons. This is an awesome mouse pad. I love it, and I'm probably gonna buy a bunch of these. I highly recommend this thing, and it uses the same kind of soft surface as their regular gaming mouse pads. It's a good one. The last piece of the setup was the keyboard and I'm very picky about keyboards. I couldn't use my regular master up control or master up alt keyboard. That's a keyboard that really depends on its RGB to look nice. If you don't have that stuff, the keys are even hard to read with those keycaps. It's not a good keyboard for this particular setup. The truth is I never found the perfect keyboard. I have one that's being made by Nathan from Teha Keyboards, but in the meantime, I've settled on this. This is the Razer Huntsman Mini and there's there's so much I like about this keyboard. It's not perfect, like you can hear the problem right there. The stabilizers are not ideal, it rattles, but the typing experience on this is solid and I love the size. It connects with USB-C so it can use that keyboard cable to connect into the mouse to juice it up whenever I need to. And I feel like this is a keyboard that doesn't need to light up to look good, right? It's got a very clean aesthetic, optical switches, and it just looks really nice in this setup. Now it's also a nice size. I like smaller keyboards and it's, I mean, it's for gaming, like you just tilt it and it lets you move your mouse without it getting in the way. But that's my anti-RGB setup. And I hope it inspires some of you guys to build systems that are not rainbows because rainbows are a little too much sometimes. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. I'll see you guys next time.